Hey everyone, it's David from Mighty Boy Studio and this is part two of our tutorial series on how to make an arcane style in Blender. Now, last tutorial we explored how to do stylized hair using particles and today we're gonna take a deeper look into what makes arcane so unique uh, from how to paint textures, set up the shading and make the most out of camera mapping. And finally, I'm gonna show you how I used all these techniques to create my own character and animated shots for the opening of my project Tidal Blades. All right, so that's a tall order but uh, as with anything new and difficult, I try to break it down in small steps. So I wanna start with some observations, pinpoint what are the challenges exactly we need to overcome, and then we're gonna find solutions for each of them. So just grab a seat and let's get started. All right, so the first observation I wanna make is about backgrounds and the fact that if they all look so beautiful is because they are literally painted from the camera in almost every shot. And if you have experience in 3D, it might be quite obvious already, but I still wanna point it out because it's an important part of, of Arcane in general. So let's take this room as an example. You can see this best on the small chest here. Pay close attention to this last bolt. You see how this part is very flat, it's pointing this way? Well, if we switch to a shot of the same chest a little later, look how the bolt is different. You don't have this flat edge here anymore. It's sort of round and the highlights are much thinner and higher res. So that means it was literally redrawn from the camera for this close-up shot. And a good way to tell if something is camera projected is usually through the shadows. Notice how you can see these painted strokes here and this dash of orange in the transition. Now compare with the shadow projected from the chest here and you'll see the difference. So camera projections is something we're gonna learn how to make in just a few minutes, but for now, uh, there's a couple more things I want you to look at. So the second observation I wanna make is about their shader. And I'm putting this in quotation marks in my mind because I don't believe they do have a perfect shader for every situation. I think almost everything you see in this show is artfully assembled and compositing. And if in a particular instance, something is going to be better defined by a 3D light, like on the arm of this character, then they're gonna use lights. And if they feel like the base texture is gonna work better as is, you're just gonna color correct it so it feels like it's lighting, but it's actually a texture. And this piece of metal here is a good example because the right side is in the shadows, you might expect it to be from the lighting. But if you actually look at the texture on ArtStation, you'll see it's part of the texture itself. The next observation I wanna make is about uh, specular. Now, many of the characters in Arcane would have this very iconic three-point highlight in the eyes, and it doesn't always move the same. Sometimes it will follow perfectly the eye movement, sometimes only partially, or it might wiggle a bit to show emotion. So it's clear it's just drawn on another layer and they animate it by hand. But even on other shiny surfaces, they never shy out of painting the specular instead of letting the 3D lights decide where it would go. Um, see this creature, which is, by the way, one of the cutest and coolest thing I have seen on this show, but that's beside the point. Um, check out these little painted specular here and there. Um, they just stay in place when the creature moves. Uh, sometimes they sort of disappear when it turns its head because it's not in the same angle, but they don't move like you would expect such an highlight to do, and, and that's fine. It's, in fact, one reason you can barely feel these are 3D animated characters. Okay, so the final observation honestly blew my mind when I noticed it. And it's something I'm quite sure not many of you realize because they do it so seamlessly that you almost can't see it. So I want you to pay very close attention to the shadow projected on her arm here. Just at the end of the shot, you can see the arm rotate a bit just before she jumps and check out how the shadow actually follows the arm like if it was part of the texture. Now, if the shadow was 3D, you would expect it to be staying in the same place uh, like this, not move as if part of the arm. In fact, you can even see a shadow pop in and out of existence on the shirt right here, and still the arm shadow isn't affected. So I'm almost 100% sure this is projected, and it's hard to see because it's so well done, but if you really look for it, you're gonna see some small details that, you, that were clearly um, painted over to add some higher details here and there. All right, so now that we know what we're trying to achieve, how about we do fun little projects just to get warmed up? I'm gonna call it um, our Arkin style default cube. 
and I'm gonna use it to demonstrate a couple of camera projections tricks. So I went ahead and created a simple cube with a couple of bevels and subdivisions to break up the shape. I've also imported an image with these gears. Um, I found them on the art station, they were made by our texture artists who worked on the show. And we're gonna use them as reference to paint the cube in the same style. I'm using a square resolution for my camera of 4096. And I also changed my color management settings from filmic to standard. Uh, just to make sure that whatever I project or render is going to look the same on screen. Um, something I always do when I do stylized work. So I'm going to do a viewport render, save this as cube render, and I'm going to bring this in Photoshop to do a quick paint over. So I'm going to speed things up a bit here because there's a lot of things we want to cover, but let me walk you through uh, my thought process while I'm painting. Here I'm using the lasso tool, so I'm only painting on one face at once. And what I'm trying is just to create some slight variation between each face so they look um, a bit more 3D. I try to always start with um, bigger shapes at first and then slowly add in the smaller details. As you can see, I'm also picking up with the um, color picker colors from the gears. And I'm not just using brown colors, but also green-blue hues to give it a bit of variation. Next, you're going to see I'm going to add some uh, highlights on the edges. And it's something they do on every prop and every character in Arcane. It's really part of the style. And I'm not just going to add them on the edges, but also on the surface itself. And notice how the angle of the scratches is different on every side. And I'm doing this on purpose to give it more uh, treatiness, even without lighting. Here I'm adding some darker scratches as well. And you're gonna notice I'm not just using darker colors, but also lighter colors just to highlight the side if, and give those cavities a bit more volume. So I'm using Photoshop here because, um, well, I'm a full-time illustrator and this is the tool I like to use most for painting, but you don't have to use Photoshop. You can use any um, painting app that you like. I know many artists, we use uh, Clip Studio Paint. So anyway, here I'm sort of um, roughing up the edges a bit so they're not so perfect. And Arcane is a gritty world, and I kind of want to give this impression this cube has been uh, dropped on the floor a few times or bumped over. And I want to say don't get discouraged if this is difficult for you to make this cube. This is perfectly normal, and that's why I chose a simple object to start with. You want to fail faster. You want to try different things in a row. It's okay if it's not perfect, but you're going to improve um, more rapidly. It's going to be more fun overall. Okay, and here you're going to see I'm going to start painting something uh, simple underground. Um, just so that it's not a flat color. And I'm using a darker color on the left to give the impression it's casting a shadow. And notice how I'm using a slightly darker color very close to the, to the cube. It's sort of um, faking occlusion, I guess, but in a more uh, painterly way. And here I'm doing a quick jump back in Blender just to have some reference for lighting. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a plane and I'm insetting another face here, which I'm deleting, so that I have this larger plane with a hole in it and it's going to cast a sort of light in the center. And I want to use this as reference to add a bit of lighting uh, to our camera projection. So I'm not quite sure what I'm looking for. I'm just moving it around, trying to find some interesting angle for shadows and how it falls on the cube. And I'm pretty happy with this. So I'm going to do a, a viewport render. I'm going to save this and bring this back in Photoshop. OK, so back in Photoshop. And I just copied and pasted the lighting on top. And, and I encourage you to play with uh, blending modes here. I'm using it in color dodge and playing with the levels of my render to uh, get a nice lighting effect. And I'm copying this light again over my cube, which is on a different layer. And again, playing with the levels to find something I find interesting. Now, I'm also going to want to paint some orange on the side of this uh, lighted section here. And I don't know if you remember the um, reference with powder and the chest, but this is what I'm trying to emulate. I'm using a, an orange color and a new layer. I'm just painting it on the side here to give a delight some um, bleeding effect. Um, so it looks a bit more interesting. And finally, I'm just going to uh, paint out those gears, which I don't really need anymore. And I'm going to save this so we can start uh, projecting it back onto our cube and floor in the 3D scene. Okay, so back in Blender, and I'm mostly done with Photoshop, so I'm going to bring the speed back uh, to normal speed in Blender so you can better follow. So here, still um, looking at the cube and floor from a camera, I'm going to select both at once, then press U and project from view. So what it did is it created some UV mapping for us as if projected from the camera, as you can see here in the UV editor. 
And now I'm going to go in the material properties and I'm going to switch the principal BSDF for an emission shader. And then I'm going to click on this little yellow dot, pick image texture and open the image we exported from Photoshop. Now we need to apply the material on our plane as well. And as you can see, it's going to look a bit uh, weird at first. And whenever things look weird like this after camera projections, it's usually because there's not enough subdivision. And as you can see, I'm going to add a couple more, uh, four or five. I'm going to press U again, then project from view, and it's going to fix uh, everything. It's going to look just like we did, uh, like the painting we did in Photoshop. Now, if I look around in the scene, you're going to notice that things don't look as good when I'm not looking from the camera. And it's because we're using the same texture for the floor and the cube. And we need to do an alternate texture just for the floor that doesn't have the cube in it. So here I'm just going to um, copy the texture we did and sort of erase the cube as best I can and paint the lighting behind it. That way we can use that texture uh, to apply on the material for our floor. Okay, and now this is exported. I'm back in Blender, back at normal speed. And I'm going to uh, create, a, actually rename this material to cube. And I'm going to create a copy for the floor and name this one floor. And I'm going to change the image texture for the one we just made. So as you can see, it mostly fixed the problem we had, but we still have a couple of problems. Uh, notice the weird lighted bits on each of those edges here. Um, this is because the camera is projecting here and stops at the edge here. Uh, let me jump back in camera view and show you. Actually, in, in the UV editor, you can see it pretty well. And this matches what we see from the camera. And what we need is for the texture not to repeat when it goes outside the UV square. So I'm going to go in the shader editor and I'm going to change this repeat option to X10. And it works because I have a brown color and my world color is brown too. So it's just extending that brown color on all sides and it works. So I'm pretty happy with this, uh, but let's say we have a camera move and we at some point are going to see behind the cube. And so a camera moves and then boom, you see here how this looks weird. Um, this is because I'm going to select the faces here and you're going to see the reason they look weird is because they're picking their color information from the front of the cube that we painted. And this is not what we want. What we want is for this to be textured differently. So there's a few ways to uh, fix this. And one of them is to do a second camera projection. So let me just move this gear here. I'm going to rename my camera to camera projection one. And then I'm going to duplicate it with shift D and call it projection two. Um, so I'm going to jump in my camera and go in my scene settings and change the camera to the second camera that you just made. And that way, if I move it, uh, first you have to go in view, uh, lock camera to view, and then I can move it on the side here. We're going to be able to do a second camera projection and fix this bit here. So what I'm going to do is select my cube and we don't want to overwrite the original UV mapping done from the first camera projection. So we're going to go in the object data properties under UV maps and we're going to create a new one with the plus button. I'm going to rename it UV map two. So you see, if I select my faces, go back to the first UV map, I'm going to have my original. And if I click on the second one, then select my faces and press U, project from view. If I switch between the two, you can see I now have two different UV sets. And by default, images are gonna use the first one, the one called UV map. But I can use this vector input here uh, to plug in a different UV set if I want to. And that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna go in the, um, I'm gonna, actually going to do a render. So view, viewport render image. I'm gonna bring this back in Photoshop and we're gonna paint over uh, the bits that we don't like. Okay, so back in Photoshop, creating a new layer. I'm selecting this face and filling it up with a flat sort of gradient color. And then I'm using some larger brushes at first to break up the shape. And then I'm using the lasso tool to do a nice sharp selection, paint a bit on it and use a smaller brush to give it a bit of volume. Now to export, all we need is the new layer we painted. So I'm gonna hide the one underneath. I'm gonna save this as a transparent PNG bring it back in Blender. Okay, so now I'm back in Blender. And what we want to do first is create a new uh, image texture. So I'm going to do Shift A, uh, type in image texture. I'm going to click on uh, open and pick the new uh, transparent PNG that we made in Photoshop. 
And as I explained earlier, we need a different UV set for this image. I'm going to type in UV map. I'm going to pick the UV map 2 that we made with the second camera. And I'm going to connect the UV output to the vector so that we're using this UV map for this image. And if I switch to the UV editor, you're going to see uh, I really need to use this second UV map. Otherwise, the new thing we painted is just not going to be aligned properly uh, with the cube. So let's go back to the shader editor. And now we need to mix this new image on top of the other one. So I'm going to need a mix RGB. And I'm going to use the first one as color 1, the second one as color 2, and then we're going to use the alpha uh, to tell it where this new color is going to appear. And if I plug this into the emission, you're going to see the result. Uh, actually, if I switch back, you're going to see uh, the difference. Now this doesn't work. And now with the new projection, we have fixed this face in the back. And here's how it looks. Uh, I encourage you to try this simple cube. It's a good exercise. And you can add a bit of sharpen. Here I'd use an unsharp mask in After Effects. Helps you see the textures a tiny bit better. OK, so I'm going to go back in the scene because there's one last thing I want to show you. It's a really awesome technique I just discovered a couple months back, and I've been using it nonstop ever since. So you remember when I told you that doing the second camera projection was one way to add the texture in the back? So let me show you the other way. I'm going to go in edit mode and going to select these edges on the side here to unwrap the cube. So I'm just control shift clicking to select hold lines. And I'm um, trying to um, sort of unfold this cube. So once they are all selected, I'm going to mark them as seams. So I'm going to press uh, U and mark seam. Now go to your object data properties, create a new UV set. I'm going to call it unwrapped. And select all your faces, press U, and then unwrap. I'm going to go to the UV editor. And if everything worked correctly, you should see this cross shape here. I'm going to just resize it, place it in the center uh, like this. And now that you've got this, check this out. Let's go to the shader editor. And I'm going to create a new image. And uh, I'm going to click New. And then make sure that Alpha is enabled. Click on the color and bring down the Alpha value to 0. Uh, rename it to, I don't know, Bake Texture. And uh, then you're going to change the resolution to 4096. And the reason we're calling this Bake Texture is because we're going to bake all this information onto our unwrapped cube. So for this, I'm going to need a new camera. I'm going to call it um, Bake Camera. Then I'm going to go to my Scene Properties. And I'm going to change the active camera to this new camera and move it um, this way. Then I'm going to hide a couple of things. Uh, the floor, go to my Render Settings, uh, change Film to Transparent, and just uh, frame this nicely like this. And now I'm ready. So I'm going to go in my Texture Paint mode. Go to Tool, make sure your bake texture is selected, and then go all the way down to a weirdly hidden uh, section called Options External, and change this resolution to 4096, just like our camera output settings. And this is going to take a render and bring it into the image editor of your choice. You can change this into your preference settings, into File Paths. I have Photoshop here. And click uh, Quick Edit. So it's automatically bringing this image in Photoshop. And I'm just going to save it, not do anything else. Then you want to go back in Blender and click the button Apply. And that's all you need to do. Now, to see the result, you'll need to plug the right UV set. So I'm going to duplicate this one, change it to Unwrapped, and plug it into the vector like we did before. And if I plug the result here, you're going to see that we baked the result of our render onto the Unwrapped cube. Um, so you see that this part here didn't uh, quite uh, render. But that's OK. We can just plug back the original projection, do a quick edit, do a quick save in Photoshop, go back, click Apply, and then we do this on the other side as well. Quick edit, save, go back in Blender, apply. And then if you plug in the result of this image, you can see we baked all that information onto our unwrapped cube. Now, I don't know if you understand the implications of this, but this literally means we can now bake stuff in Eevee, which I always thought was impossible. We're going to see later in this tutorial how to make the best use of this technique to build uh, textures for a character. But first, let me just show you how to fix this common problem you might encounter, which is those thin black lines here. I'm going to save uh, our image as a PNG, and then we're going to open it in Photoshop. 
And you're gonna see you're gonna have a single layer over transparency. I'm gonna duplicate it and put it under, apply a Gaussian blur on it, and I'm gonna duplicate it a bunch of times. And that way you can create a very quick and dirty bleed effect, but it's gonna fix uh, those black lines if you save this and then uh, go back in Blender. So here I'm gonna use the shortcut Alt-R to refresh, and as you can see the thin line is gone, and I can just start like painting over. I'm in paint mode, so I can just uh, use my brush and fix whatever I need. This is like a standard texture on an unwrapped model. But because we painted it at first from the camera, it's got this nice uh, 2D feel to it. So, I mean, you can go ahead and fix anything you find that's wrong, like this uh, darker line here. You can fill up the uh, darker sections that had uh, just no projections in the beginning. Um, I mean, Blender is not bad to uh, as a painting program. I just find that it's sometimes lacking some of the textured brush that I really like in Photoshop. But to do this kind of fix, it's really nice to just be able to rotate around your model and fix it. So I like to switch between the two. And you can really use the two uh, at any time. Like, for instance, I could um, go in Quick Edit and open Photoshop. Whoops. OK, so this is too far off. This is because I was not inside my camera. So just go back in the camera. That's why we need to make sure that the um, resolution of our scene matches the screen grab and we're inside a camera. Otherwise, you might get some weird framing like this. So I'm going to go in Quick Edit. And now it's going to be framed properly. And I can just paint whatever. Uh, I'm going to do a new layer. And this is important. I'm going to paint some stuff, um, whatever I want. Um, and then. This is the, the key point is I'm going to delete the underlying layer. So I'm just going to keep this, I'm going to save this. And when I go back in Blender and apply, it's just going to apply the new changes I did. So it's, it's not going to screw up anything. It's just going to add this a painted layer on top. Then I can continue painting in Blender. It's just super quick and intuitive. And I cannot believe this option is so well hidden. And I just learned about this now. All right, so let's say you're ready for the next step and want to do your own character. What you see here is uh, Dust. She's one of the main characters in the board game Title Blades. And I did a short animation with her for the opening video for the Kickstarter, um, which you see here. So this is the scene with just the character model. And I want to focus on shading and texturing in this tutorial. So I'm not going to spend much time on the modeling. Uh, I can show you the topology here. To be honest, I, I wouldn't say my sculpt is as good as any of the characters that you see on the show Arcane. Um, I did my best with the limited time I had. Um, and you can look it up um, on ArtStation. But their sculpts are really, really good. Check out the clothes, um, all the nicely sculpted wrinkles. This is how they get all the nice uh, rim lights um, on their characters. So back to my own uh, Blender scene. I'm going to uh, switch in rendered view to show you the textures. Now, this is rendered in real time in Blender Eevee. Uh, and you can see it lags a little, mostly because I have the hair enabled. There's like thousands of them. If I turn it off, it's going to be much more responsive. And all my lights are dynamic, so I can move around the rim light, and they're all casting shadows and whatnot. This was done using the Lightning Boy shader, which is really well suited to do this kind of stylized work inside Blender. And I'm going to show you how that works. Now, before we do any complex shading, of course, we're going to need a base texture for a character. And this is a step that can be really daunting. So I'm going to give you a tip. Remember earlier when we baked the result of our two camera projections onto our cube, right? I told you this is amazing because you normally cannot bake in Eevee. Well, we can use this to our advantage. Uh, we can create a basic shader and then bake that result onto a texture and then start from there to add more details and use our cool brushes, but at least we'll add a base. And this project is the first time I used this technique and honestly, it worked really well. So let me walk you through my process. First step is base colors. So you don't need any shader. You can delete that and just create an image texture. I'm gonna make it pretty big here because I want this to encompass the whole body. So I'm gonna make it 8K and recall this dust body texture. I'm just going to make this a light gray and plug it into the material output. And just to make sure this is clear, you do need a UV uh, mapping done on your character for this to work. So uh, make sure to um, unwrap your model. I'm not going to show you how to do that here, but it needs to be all lined up onto the same UV square here for this to work. So here to start adding some different colors onto our model, we're going to go in an edit mode and start doing some selections. I'm going to use the shortcut L for select length. 
going to select everything that's connected together. So now I've selected the pens here. And if I go to texture paint, press N to open the tool settings and just make sure I'm painting in the right texture and choose a color. Now you also need the paint bucket. Uh, I'm going to press T and uh, click on fill here. And then I'm going to pick the teal color from my image reference. If you don't have any image reference, then you can just choose the color you want. And I'm going to click on the pens. Now at this point, if everything turns the same color, it's because you forgot to activate the paint mask option like I did. Uh, so you need to go at the top right next to the texture paint mode and click on this little button called paint mask. And that way, if you use the fill um, tool again, it's only going to be filling that color inside your selection. And here I'm going to speed things up because it's going to be a bit repetitive. But if you do that with every part of your character that has a different color, eventually you're going to end up with something that looks like this just something nice and flat. Next step is going to be adding a bit of shading, occlusion, specular, stuff like that, that we can bake on top of our flat colors um, to serve as a better base for the texture. And to do this, I'm going to start using the Lightning Boy shader. And I know not every one of you is using it. So just to make sure you're not confused about what I'm doing, let me just explain what it is. If you've watched the previous hair tutorial, you'll be familiar with the setup of having BSDFs followed by shader to RGB nodes and color ramps and all of that stacked on top of each other using RGB mix nodes. With the Lightning Boy shader, you have a built-in layer stack. And if you want to create more layers, you have a new menu where you can uh, create those uh, pre-built custom nodes that you can plug in as new layers. And if you want to change the setting of these nodes, you just press H on any node and it's going to open up some options, which kind of replace the color ramp, but are a bit more intuitive. Okay, so here I'm going to start using the Lightning Boy shader. And you do need to have it enabled under your preferences add-ons to see the same options as I'm, as I'm seeing. And my goal here is not to force you to buy this shader. If you want to encourage us, uh, it's super appreciated. But please stick around if you don't, because I'm going to do my best to really teach you uh, the logic of what I'm doing so that if you want to recreate this with basic nodes, uh, you are able to. So here I created the basic Lightning Boy shader with just one layer, which is my flat uh, colors. And here I'm connecting the key light in the second layer to add shadows on top of it. By default, the key light node wants to add illumination, but here I want shadows. So I'm inverting it and using a darker color and just playing with the settings a bit. For a base texture like this, I don't want the shadows to be too strong. So that's why I'm using an opacity of about 0.5. And here I'm going to move my light, the one that's connected to the key light node called character. I'm going to rotate it forward so I don't have as many shadows. And here I'm just continuing to add more layers. I'm going to do a specular on layer three. And remember, we're not doing the shader for the character. We're only creating a base texture and using the shader to help us make that first base texture. Okay, so here I don't want to use a pure white color for a specular and just dropping the opacity is not going to cut it. So I'm going to create a RGB curve and going to connect the original flat colors into it and use that as the color for the specular. And that way you should get uh, much nicer results. When you play with these shader settings, it's important to remember that you're going to eventually project all these details from a specific camera onto your texture. So make sure to jump in your camera once in a while and adjust the lights from there. It's not as important for diffuse, but specular is going to change based on the angle you're looking at it. So make sure to adjust it um, based on that camera. And this is where the offset setting on the specular can be really useful because you can sort of uh, move the specular around exactly where you need it. And one last thing that can help to really get those nice details in there before you bake this is ambient occlusion. So here I'm creating a screen space ambient occlusion and putting it in uh, layer four. And again, here I'm playing with the settings, softness, range, max distance, just to, you know, tweak this to your liking. And before I show you how to bake this, remember, you don't have to use the same material for every piece on your character. Like here, I was finding that arm was a bit too shiny. So I just made a duplicate material, uh, made it unique. And uh, of course, you can always uh, rename your materials if you want to keep track of what is what. Um, and then once you have done that, you can go in edit mode and select your pieces, assign them the new material, and you can change the material. Um, so like here, I'm going to tweak the specular a bit to make it softer, a bit bigger, a bit more transparent. So it looks like uh, actual skin. So let's say I'm happy with this. Uh, how do I do to bake it? Well, I do the same as I did with the cube. 
Uh, first, you need an image texture onto which to put the baked information. So uh, remember, you need to click alpha and drop it down to zero so it's completely transparent. What's gonna create some issues this time is we have a specular in there and specular is gonna move around as we project from different directions around a model. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna have speculars all over the place. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create a color node. This is a Lightning Boy specific node. Um, and I'm going to plug the color into the color and alpha into alpha mask. So basically this turns this image into a new layer I can use. And I'm gonna create a fifth layer and connect that layer into it. So basically what we did is we created a transparent image and we added it as a new layer on top of everything. And because it's transparent, uh, it shouldn't affect anything at this point. Uh, everything should look exactly the same. Now, let's see what happens when we bake this. I'm gonna go in texture paint and uh, you wanna make sure to not leave this at fill. Uh, it really needs to be in draw mode. And then I'm going to unclick the paint mask option, which we don't need anymore. And I'm gonna click on uh, N to um, open up the tool settings. Make sure to click on your bake texture, not uh, your flat colors. And then I'm gonna go down at the very bottom, at the uh, option edit on their um, external. And then I'm gonna change this to 4K because 8000 is probably gonna crash uh, Blender. And I'm gonna click on quick edit. And just like with our cube, it's gonna bring a render into Photoshop. We're just gonna save it, go back in Blender. And I'm gonna press uh, apply. And uh, wait a bit for it to um, project it back. Okay, and now a uh, little challenge. Can you guess what's uh, different when I move my camera? You see how the specular is not moving anymore? And the reason is we're not looking at the specular, we're looking at the baked texture. And wherever this is black, this is where nothing has been projected yet. But since we're using this as a layer on top of everything else, where there's no texture, you're just seeing the original shader underneath. So this is pretty neat. And uh, all that's left to do is to project from all the other directions. Okay, so I'm gonna skip ahead a bit. And here you can see the final baked texture once I'm done reprojecting from all directions. You can see it's not perfect, uh, especially when different pieces of geometry intersect, you really need to come in and fix those. Sometimes it's easier to do in Photoshop. Uh, you can also do it in Blender. And you can see there's also a couple of assets that I decided to hide for this projection, uh, such as the swords, uh, the hanging capes, uh, the shield too. These were all projected separately onto their own texture. So the process is completely the same. Here you can see I did some kind of basic lighting. I just reprojected that onto it. And now I'm uh, refining the details in Photoshop just to add a bit more scratches and definition. For the head, uh, same process, but I wanted to have um, a lot of resolution because I knew I had this close-up shot at the end. So I used the 8K textures just for the head. First, I just set up a basic lighting like for the other assets. Then I projected this from the front and did a pretty good pass just in Photoshop. And here you can see I drew the eyes and the eyelashes and the pursing, uh, but just because it was too weird not having them in there uh, to evaluate if the texture was working correctly, but they're not part of the projection. And as you can see, after I first projected it, there were still a bunch of stuff that didn't work under the chin. So I fixed all that. And uh, a lot of the work was just adding details that I didn't see from the front. And here's an example of something that I find super useful in Photoshop. I wanted to paint some tattoos on her neck and I just didn't like the result I was getting Blender. It was a bit too soft. So what I did is I, I basically just sketched them in in Blender and then I redid a projection from Photoshop and I used vector curves to really draw them in uh, super sharp. And then I painted inside uh, the selection using like soft gradients. And here you can see the result when it's projected back. Now, as far as lighting goes, uh, as we took note in our observations, we don't necessarily want to shade the character the same depending on the shot. Sometimes you might want a rim light, but other times maybe you just want to use the base texture with some color adjustment. So let's look at how to do that with the Lightning Boy shader. So let's start with a shader with just our base color as layer one. So if you just want to do a color adjustment, usually RGB curves will give you the most control. The quickest way to add this adjustment is to press tab on the Lightning Boy shader node that will give you access to RGB curves that applies on top of all your layers. Or you can create the RGB curves node from the default Blender nodes and then you can place it after your image texture. 
So what's cool with the RGB curves is you can not only play with the contrast, but if you go in the individual color channels, you can also uh, affect the general color balance. Now this is going to affect the whole texture. So let's say you want to adjust something, but just at the bottom of your character or just the shoulder. So how do you do that? Well, with the Lightning Boy shader, you can create gradients and it makes this very easy for this purpose. So here I'm adding a spherical gradient in layer two. And by default, it's going to be just a pure color. But then if I do a RGB curves and um, modify my original image texture with it, you can see this is going to limit where the color correction appears. And this is very similar when you think about it to just compositing in real time. This is something you would do um, in uh, Nuke or in After Effects, but here I'm just doing it in Eevee. And it's so much fun because I don't have to worry about puzz mats and stuff like that. I'm just literally editing the material of my object. So what else can you do? Well, you can create a key light if you want to add shadows. Now, if you just use a darker shadow on top of your texture, you're going to realize that it starts to look a bit 3D. So for this, what I like to do is to create a custom shadow texture in Photoshop. And what I'm looking for when I paint this shadow is I'm trying to pick not the darkest color, but one of the darker color that I'm painting using the blend mode called Darken. And what uh, Darken does is it's only going to affect the colors that are lighter than the color I'm painting with. And here's why this is important. Because we already have some kind of shadows painted in our texture, we don't need to make these sections even darker. What we need is for everything else to be as dark as the shadow that is painted in the texture. So let me show you how that, uh, how that looks in the scene. So here I've connected the new image into the color of the key light. And as you can see, instead of just darkening everything, the shadows blend a bit more seamlessly with the original texture. And here's a shot from Arcane that shows well what I mean. Now look at this section on the cheeks here, the darker red section. Uh, this is coming from a light because you see it fade away as he raises his head. And if you skip a little later, there's a place where there's barely any lighting on the face. And you can see that the color that they chose is really exactly the same one as the darkest one under the eyes here. And that's why it's, it blends so seamlessly. Now, what if you want to add a very bright section of light on your character, not just a darker shadow? Well, it's going to be even simpler. Uh, you can just use a key light node if you want and uh, choose a super bright color. I mean, here again, you could uh, create an alternate texture if you want and make it brighter and connect it into the color, but it really depends on what's your intention. Now let's talk about uh, specular. You can see here that this two point highlight is painted and I exported it as a separate PNG. That way I can use it as a standalone layer and I can even plug in a um, texture coordinate and mapping node to uh, translate it if I need to move it. Okay, so time is running out and I want to show you one last thing you can do with camera mapping. Here's an example where despite all my best efforts applying the technique I just showed you, I just couldn't get the lighting I was looking for. But here's the beauty about reprojecting details is that you can always just create a new layer on top of everything, your lighting, your shadows. As we saw, you only need to create a new transparent image, use a color node to connect it as a layer on top. One thing I didn't mention so far is if you have bloom enabled, you should turn it off before doing the projection. Uh, and once that's done, you can just go in texture paint mode Make sure to select the right texture and find the quick edit button at the very bottom. This is really no different than when we were baking our shader onto our texture. In fact, it's almost easier now because we already have an animated camera so we can just project from there. Just don't forget to turn off the underlying render when you're done and so that way you only project the new changes. And it can work even if the character is moving a lot. You just need to animate the opacity of that layer um, if necessary. And if you do it carefully and choose your frames right, it's going to be pretty seamless. And you know what? This whole establishing shot is made of multiple projections that I animate the opacity of one after the other as I get closer to that mountain. So as you can see, there's really no limits to what you can do with this kind of projections. And I hope it gives you ideas for your own projects. All right, so that's it for this tutorial. I hope you learned a few things and thought that was interesting. Um, if you do try to make the arcing style uh, default cube or even your own character, please share your work with us on Twitter. We always love to see that. Uh, if Tarot Blade seems like something that might interest you, uh, I encourage you to visit the Kickstarter page. It's currently in the last few days of the campaign, but I think you can still pledge uh, if you miss it. 
And of course, if you like the Lane Boy shader, you can also check it out on our Gumroad page. So um, thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.